Okay, so then we open up on, like I said, a title crawl that gives some, uh, some background on this war that's happening uh, on yep. the continent of Ignis, right? I call this section the geopolitical info dump. Yes. <laughs> because they, th they throw a lot of geo geopolitics and power structures at you right at the beginning of this game because I don't think I realized this until after playing it for the podcast, but this game is obsessed with power structures. So it's, mm. it's got to let, it's got to let us know about all the different uh, movers and shakers of this world right at the beginning where I don't think it's necessary right here. I don't think there's, there's, there's not enough context, but it's here. It's kind of like a star Wars type thing where you're not going to really get all the references on this, on this crawl until, you know, you, your, your second time yeah, through. Xenogears opens with a movie and then a tech stump that have nothing to do with the immediate actual gameplay. Yeah. Right. Which is, <laughs> Interesting. And I, I want to talk about this uh, with you guys in a second, too, about, like, how you feel about the intro as a hook. And, like, and, and when I mean intro, I mean not just, like, the prologue anime cutscene, but, like, all the stuff that leads up to where you actually start playing, where you actually have mm -hmm. control, Faye. But um, let's just uh, quickly summarize what it's talking about. So Ignis, um, the word Ignis is Latin for fire, which I think is kind of interesting because the continent of Ignis is sort of embroiled in the fires of war, right? So I don't know if that's purposeful or not, but it is kind of an interesting uh, little possible reference there. But um, it talks about these two nations who share this continent that are at war with each other, been war at war with each other for so long, nobody even really remembers like the reason why they started fighting. Um, and you have the, the Kislev Empire to the north and the kingdom of Ave to the south. Now, I think it would have really helped uh, when you're giving big info dumps like this to have some kind of visual like companion to help you like follow what they're yeah. talking about. The Indiana Jones map. <laughs> yeah, it could have been, it could have, it, it just as easily just been a map. So I'm gonna pull up a map here and kind of like just put it on screen so people can see this. Basically on this continent, anything that is green or mountainous is Kislev <laughs> and anything that is a desert is Ave. So that's kind of how it's like the borders are split, right? Um, and so these are the two nations that are at war with each other. They were fighting in a very conventional, sort of traditional way for a long, long time. Um, but then we have these kind of third party institutions that sort of step in and begin to interfere with this. And uh, essentially it, it's by um, repairing technology that is excavated from ruins found in either country. So there's all these ruins in, in both uh, territories that they're kind of excavating these giant mechs called gears. And this, uh, this institution called Ethos essentially steps in and repairs um, these, these gears and this technology for them so that they can use it in their campaigns against each other. Um, the Ethos is also said to be an institution that's supposed to be preserving the world's culture and things like that. Um, basically, it's a religious institution. The um, I believe the Japanese word for that was used in the original script was was just church, right? And yes. this was a this was a another Richard Honeywood catch of the like we should change that. And <laughs> I think they land on something that sounds much cooler anyway. So yeah. uh, it works out. Yeah, you're right. They just refer to it as the church. It was always the church in Japanese. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, it was changed in English to ethos. That's that's a good call. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, and so anyways, the, the war is sort of like, you know, swinging both ways, and then it looks like Ave is kind of on the retreat, Kislev is starting to like really win, and then a, a special force called Gebler uh, steps in and basically helps Ave like recover and basically start uh, winning. So they start actually capturing, capturing territory from Kislev. A lot of this is, it, it feels like it's just kind of, um, it feels like you said, just like a big info dump and like, do we really need to know this right now? And we could debate whether or not like now is exactly the right time to reveal it, but it is all very important uh, context for the story. Um, and then uh, it basically says there's a remote village called Lahan. It's on the outskirts of Ave. It's kind of near the border with Kislev. And this is where the story is really gonna begin. Um, but I do want to mention too, uh, the names, naming conventions here. Uh, Kislev, Ave, these were um, the names of uh, months in the Hebrew calendar. Um, and there are several other locations in the game like Nisan and Sh uh, uh, Shavat that also are based on Hebrew months. Um, but Ave in particular is a misspelling. In, in Hebrew it's just Av, A-V. Um, 
but in, in Japanese, with the kana that they use, they actually purposefully added a, a, a third kana on the end that is like an a sound. So it's, I think it is meant to be pronounced ave, kind of like purposefully putting that a on there. But the original um, Hebrew uh, word is av. So I'm gonna be calling it ave because I think that sounds a little better than av, <laughs> and I think that's how it's meant to be yeah. pronounced, but anyways. Um, so we kind of zoom in to Lahan as there's like some explosions and some gunfire. And we were introduced to our main character, Fei Fan Wong. All right, so my next notes here, Fei Wong. So his name is Fei Fong Wong, or in the Japanese, it's Wong Fei Fong, because Wong comes first, being the family name, right? So Wong Fei Fong is meant to be similar to the Chinese name Wong Fei Hong, who is very famous in Chinese folklore. Um, he, so if you've ever seen the movie, the Jackie Chan movies, Legend of Drunken Master, or any of the Drunken Master movies, um, Jackie Chan is portraying Wong Fei Hung. And it is, it's great. He, he is just a famous, famous martial arts, you know, folklore Chinese person. They just, they, they love him. And he was back around the time, you know, before the communists took over. And it was a, a fabled time within China, especially in Hong Kong, uh, where things were a little bit different after the communists took over. And that was where Jackie Chan came from. So, um... Anyways, very important stuff there, and I believe Wang Fei Hong was from Guangdong, which is near Hong Kong, which is that kind of area. Um, and also, Fei Hong, uh, no, Fei Fong Wong, our main character in this game, he's a martial artist. He's into Kung Fu. So that, in my opinion, that solidifies the connection there. As he's piloting uh, a gear, and he's fighting off some intruders in the village and trying to fend them off, and he's being warned by another character, uh, I think it's supposed to be pronounced... Shitan, <laughs> but I just like Saitan so much better that that's how I'm going to say his name. Um, yeah, there's about six ways to say his name, and <laughs> they're all right. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. And again, we'll have to give Richard Honeywood some more credit for for perhaps this too. But like the, I believe in the perfect works when they Romanize the Japanese term, it's spelled S H I T A N, yeah. and he was like, you probably cannot have a character that starts <laughs> with the those those letters, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so, exactly. You know, he's There's also some neat visual effects on the opening in-game in engine sequence. Yeah. There's like battle fatigue. There's heat of like the summer boiling up and kind of mm. like a filter over the entire screen that is kind of suggesting the pilot's current mental state. Yeah. yeah, this is a much better hook than the previous two hooks that we've just spent an hour and a half going over. But <laughs> I think this, like, in in terms of like, you know, like if this game was was made today and they wanted to. To, to gra grab the player right, right up front, this should have been what we were introduced to. Like, this is a game about robots and fires. So you think the game should have started off with this battle rather than, like, with the uh, the stuff that comes I, before? Is, is that not what you're saying? Well, no, I personally, I like the the intro movie better just because it's kind of it's like this this codex that you, you can, you can uh, translate throughout the course of the game. But sure. uh, the, I, I was specifically talking about the the info dump. I don't think we need oh, the info dump. Going, yeah, going. Let's go straight into the robot fighting after we after we see the the initial cutscene. Gotcha. And, okay, and we'll go from there. For commercial purposes, it's easier to imagine a game like this starting with this point as opposed to what it actually started with. Mm. Yeah, and it's clear that they were at least cognizant of that because this is a flash forward to something that we're going to experience in real time later because we're gonna you know hop hop in time. Uh, back a little bit here in a few in a few minutes yeah it kind of flashes back to like earlier in the day right before the yeah. attack yeah mm -hmm. I, I find it I found it to be kind of confusing um, because we've already kind of had like the exciting I think kind of action sequence to kind of pull you into the game with the prologue Now I know mm -hmm. the prologue can be really difficult to understand but it's like they almost kind of want to have a secondary like here's a quick like blurb of action but then we're gonna just like transition back I, I found yeah. it personally to be a little bit clumsy. I don't think they needed to do that. I think that after the initial like prologue with the ship crash and everything like that, I, I, I debate on this. I don't know whether or not it's totally necessary right now to have this info dump of like the political background happening because Saitan basically tells Faye yeah. this later 
um, in in detail when you're in the Black Moon Forest, like when you're leaving. He basically yeah, when you need to know it. Yeah, he's talking about Gebler and he's talking about yep. the war between Ave and Kislev and stuff like that. I think this is information that you could present in dialogue with a character like Saitan rather than in this kind of like you know blocks of text on a black background where we have no visual. Um, sort of like companion to help us like see like where these things are in relation to each other. Now, this being said, I want to add that I love the atmosphere that the music creates during this kind of opening title crawl sequence. It's a track called Bonds of Sea and Fire, and it's one of my very favorite pieces of music from the whole game. As you can see here on the screen, I actually did an orchestration of this piece here on the channel um, just because it is such an important piece of music for me in relation to this game. So as much as what I'm saying here, you know, is maybe critical of the structure of the opening of the game, there is something really special about how this music, Bonds of Sea and Fire, pulls you into the world of Xenogears. It's an atmosphere that I don't think is necessarily replaceable. And I just wanted to make that clear too. So I love this track so much. Um, I feel like if the game had just kind of like opened up with the prologue and then just opened up in Lahan Village, um, but 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 that being said, there is kind of an interesting tie with the fact that he's painting the fire, right? Yes. I do really like that. So there's like all this fire and, and the village and stuff, and it kind of zooms in on the fire, and then we kind of zoom out and, and phase like painting that fire. And I do think yeah. there is some significance to that. So this might not be like the perfect way to transition between the prologue into this, um, but there, there might be another way to do it. But I do feel like the prologue, or the, the intro of the game is a little bit long, and it's also really interesting that it was going to be even longer than that. Because I think there was a, it's a, a an interview with Yasunori Mitsuda, and there's a, a track from the game called Stars of Tears. It's one of them that uh, actually has the lyrics um, yeah. that were uh, sung by uh, Joanne Hogg. Your fingertips moving gently to my heart The force of life um, she did vocals for a couple of different tracks in the game, at least for the ending credits, I think. Yeah. Um, but there was a song called Stars of Tears that was supposed to be accompanying a cutscene that was going to be like uh, the main staff credits at the beginning mm -hmm. of the game. And they ended up cutting that out for pacing reasons because it would have made like the combination of the opening movie and this last about like 10 minutes before you can even start like playing the game. <laughs> and yeah. that's a little bit long, right? Where the player just has to sit there for 10 minutes like watching this or doing nothing before they can actually even start playing the game. So it was cut. But that song, or at least the melody of it, right, was preserved in the, um, the world map theme, uh, yep. which is called Emotions. <laughs> So we still have that theme in there, but that particular rendition of it, that uh, with her singing Stars of Tears, that was actually cut from the game. So it would have been even, an even longer opening sequence. <laughs> now, I, I tend to be pretty patient with like lengthy opening sequences, especially if they're packed with like a lot of meat and juice like this is, and they have really interesting mysteries that they present. And that's why I love the prologue, uh, the, 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 you know, the Eldridge prologue. I, I think it's really, really, really fascinating sequence. And that it's, it's really well executed. It's really well directed. And, and aside from the translation issues that make it difficult to follow it, if, if those were cleaned up, I think it would have served as like a really, really perfect intro to the game. Or it does serve as a perfect intro to the game. And that we can kind of just move from there straight into Lahan rather than introducing all this political stuff in the background. Or maybe you can even just cut straight to like a gear battle. But I think that that, 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 that feels a little uneven because you have this really exciting sequence and this ship crash and then you jump right into another like battle. I feel like you kind of ease that into something that slows down a bit, right? in the Lahan sequence and then you build up to the battle, but right. anyways, 
I don't know how you guys feel about that, but. Well, in that opening battle, there's also your first taste of the battle transition screen. Yes. The glass shattering, the broken mirror, if yes. you will. Yes, yes. Which, very important. Again, nothing in this game is on accident, and that was constructed with a very deliberate purpose. Exactly. Almost everything in this game is, and, and you'll find that as you keep playing the game, like, man, like almost everything, almost everything, even something as trivial as it would seem, as a battle screen transition, right? Where that means yeah. nothing. It's just, here we go, you're about to fight, get ready. Usually it's meant to mask like a loading time, right? Yeah. Um, and in this, they've turned that even into a, an important symbol <laughs> for the game. So keep that in mind. Um, there's gonna be a lot of reference in the, references in the game to broken shards, glass shattering, um, this sort of thing. And uh, it's integral to the thematic content, the thematic purpose of the game. I remember when we first started our podcast, we kind of made the agreement of like, let's not laugh too hard at the game for as, as messy as we remembered it being, but yeah. then being shocked about how well everything fits together when, right. once you start to, to parse it out. So, and that's just another good, good example of that. It's, it's amazing. Um, now, as for the intro here into Lahan, right? We, we, like, as you guys said, we jump back. This is a really nice um, transition there, where he's painting the fire, like we were saying. Yeah, and, and painting's a thing in this game too. Yeah, he's 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 a great painter. Uh, uh, Faye is. He's he's really good. And what's strange about that is that you learn pretty quickly. You go talk to like the maid in the other room, and she basically explains how he arrived here three years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And he and he explains to Timothy when he goes upstairs that he has, uh, wait for it, retrograde amnesia. <laughs> hey, thanks. <laughs> thanks for the plug. Appreciate that. Exactly. Go check out <laughs> retrograde amnesia. Um, so he can't remember anything prior to the three years of coming into this uh, village. Now, I suppose three years would be plenty of time to become pretty good at, at painting if you had someone who could teach you and you like dedicated yourself to it you really like worked at it for three years i'm sure you could get pretty good but there's actually another npc um kind of to, i think to the south of the village who when you go talk to her she talks about how good faye is at martial arts and mm -hmm. she she describes him as being like man like you know how do you, how can you do that when uh when you know you, you have amnesia, you don't remember your past. Oh, this must be like muscle memory, basically, right? Like this this must be something that you developed in your previous life before you came here. So the fact that he's like this incredible painter and incredible martial artist, but does not remember anything from his past, uh, I think there's a nice little subtle piece of foreshadowing uh, that we see uh, in in those kind of like little hints that are dropped in the introduction. But it's all. It's all. Go, oh, go ahead. She says it like your weird aunt also says it like, oh, the body just remembers things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That like prevents you from taking it too seriously. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, <laughs> I was going to say too, the, the, the painting of the fire is also kind of this subtle implication that like Faye has some sort of premonitory ability to like know what's going to happen in the future. I don't know if that's actually true, but it makes it feel that way because he's painting what's that's happening true. in the, in the, in the yeah. future. And there's another thing, I, I don't think I noticed this the first time, I, or the last time I played the game, but if you go up to the wall in that painting room and press X on it, you can, it, it will zoom into another painting, right. impl impl implying that Faye has been doing multiple paintings since he's been here. Yeah, I there's think two there's, more. there's like three other paintings in the room, yeah. Oh, can, okay. They, they look kind of like mountain path stuff. Oh, okay. And they're, other than the obvious one, there are other Faye paintings in this game in an abstracted area that you should look out for later. Oh, nice, okay. N not like the obvious one, but um, they're floating around. Let's You'll say. see. <laughs> yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll let you know where to find those. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, so you can go around, talk to villagers. Uh, you can go play a, a, a guy in rock, paper, scissors, <laughs> kind of a funny little mini game where um, you got to beat him five times in a row, right? Uh, yeah, and it's random. So it's complete luck. Yeah, it's just total Shine. luck. You just have to, it, you can't like leave and go like save and come back. It, it'll like restart if you do that. So you basically just have to get lucky and win five times in a row. Um, and you can get some items. Uh, you need to make sure that you're talking to like all the NPCs in the in the opening village because, as we know, it it gets destroyed here soon. You're not coming back here, so there are certain items you can pick up here um, that will come in later in the story. Uh, that uh, especially there's um, an item, a mermaid tear that you pick up from yeah. a drunk guy in the tavern. Uh, that go, doesn't pay off until the end of the game. Yeah, too. it's it's like way down the line. That it this feels pays like they off. just had to throw that in there. Exactly. So it, it, it's missable stuff. So uh, make I sure. I think too that you. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I think too that 
you don't want to miss any of the NPCs here just because like this game has fascinating and downright funny NPC dialogue. Like I, sometimes I'm not sure if that's on purpose, but like there's some really good lines that are that are, that are just that are just hilarious. And th- this this holds true all throughout the game. Like I don't think of any other game uh, any of the other games that we've covered that we've gotten the amount of uh, content for lack of a better term uh, out of the NPCs that we did in Xenogears. Maybe Terra Enigma, but Xenogears is just got it's just full of great NPCs that have have funny things to say, interesting things to say. Um, bits of lore that you can get later in the game that once you get to the point to where you want to know or you're trying to figure out what's going on, uh, it's it's terrific. May I verbatim read a line from the man at the bar? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. wrote it down too, but you Do read it. it. The bar <laughs> is the laughing, the laughing fox in Piglet Tavern, according to the sign. The guy at the bar says, There is a dark and icy wind that blows where you are going, a wind that nurtures grief and resentment, inviting death from which there is no salvation. No one will be able to escape from it, but you and only you must eventually face up to that dark wind. Just kidding. I've always wanted to say that. (laughs) So again, the game hits you with something widely foreshadowing and prophetic and then just kind of brushes it off just in case you take it too seriously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great. That feels like a Masoto Kato line right there, actually. Yeah. I could definitely see that, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's kind of really, really fantastic just how much and just how many, like the, the, the wealth of hints and like plants, <laughs> you know, uh, setups for things that are going to get paid off much later in the game, mysteries that are set up here. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's, it's amazing. There's so many. And yeah, you should really take your time in Lahan Village talking to everybody and doing everything that you can. Not only because this is a location you won't, you'll not come back to later and there's missable stuff, but because of this kind of thing, right? Like there's, yeah. the NPCs have very valuable things to say. It also communicates the vibe, the close-knit relationships between everybody in in that town, which is important for the kind of emotional payoff that we're going to experience in a a few minutes. Something I noticed this playthrough when I replayed this yesterday is I don't think anyone in this town mentions a practice of religion. Mm. So I don't know if, like, the ethos has a presence here or if it's just not present in what we're shown. But I thought that given the reliance of the rest of the game on these concepts, it's weird for this kind of heathen village to exist on the outskirts. Yeah, it, it does seem very removed or just like remote from like other locations, right? So maybe maybe it was kind of settled or established as a place where they kind of were trying to get away from that <laughs> yeah, um, and maybe. just kind of live their lives doing their own thing. But that is that is an interesting pickup. Like there really isn't much reference to any kind of religion or the ethos or anything. They don't seem to have a presence at all here, um, which is really interesting. Um, so yeah, anyways, uh, the village is preparing for a wedding between Timothy and Alice, who are Faye's kind of like best friends in the village. Um, and so, you know, Timothy and his father and, uh, you know, the, the, the chief, uh, Chief Lee, they're kind of like in a room upstairs kind of talking to each other. And, uh, you know, Faye sort of uh, opines a bit about like, you know, thanking Timothy and Alice for being such good friends to him. You know, when he came into the village, he was, um, you know, obviously lost his memory and stuff like that. Um, I find a lot of the dialogue in the, the kind of, in the Lahan section to be a, a bit on the nose with like, as you know, type dialogue. <laughs> mm-hmm, um, yeah. they're, they're speaking in ways that like, don't feel like totally natural for like the player's sake so that the player understands what's going on here. Um, I wrote some of these down, like Faye says, hey, or Timothy, I just wanted to thank both you and Alice. Three years ago, I woke up in this village without a trace of my memory. I didn't know who I was, where I had been, or what I'd been doing up until that day. It's like explaining what amnesia is, explaining the fact that he has amnesia to someone who's totally aware he had amnesia. (laughs) Uh, Obviously knows that. I couldn't recall a single thing, despite that you and Alice sympathized with me and encouraged me to go on. If the two of you hadn't been there for me, I don't know what would have become of me. Timothy, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. Now you and Alice better live happily ever after. So, it, I mean, it, it's, it's, with, it's with Faye here, it's with the maid downstairs. There's a lot of that. Um, and I don't know, like, I, I understand the need for it sometimes. Sometimes you can't really get away from it. Sometimes you like, you need to tell the player something that, or, or, or the, aud- the reader, the audience, whatever. They, they need to know this information. But I think that there are better ways to do it than to deliver it with like on the nose dialogue yeah. when everyone there is totally aware of what's going on. Um, yeah. 
I, I th and I think a really good example of this within Square, actually, is uh, Yasumi Matsuno um, games like Vagrant Story, right? Like Vagrant Story's opening is like a freaking masterpiece. Have you guys played Vagrant Story? Not in many years. 20 years ago. Yeah. Oh man, it's so good. But um, the opening sequence there, like you, you won't find any dialogue like this where characters are saying things each of them know to each other, right? But at the same time, it is giving you world building. Like you're, you're coming to understand the context through what they're saying, but in the subtext rather than like on the nose. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we talked last week about like how difficult this game was to translate and the fact that it was done by one man by himself. <laughs> and so like, I don't want to harp too much on it and, and you know some of this could even just be the fact that that's the way that the Japanese was written. This is a Tetsuya Takahashi writing thing more than it is say a, a translation error or something like that. But it just gives me a lot of appreciation for the way that Yasumi Matsuno in particular can give you world building context without resorting to as you know dialogue. I think he's a freaking master at that. And so it, it's a little on the nose but you know uh, we're talking about at least at the time <laughs> games that had were just filled with funky dialogue and so uh, it's not like it's any worse necessarily than its contemporaries but um, uh, now I don't know if you guys knew this um, the original name of Alice in Japanese is Aruru uh, it's the reference to a god or a spirit or something yeah there's there's been some speculation I don't know if it's on purpose or not um, but Aruru is the surname of the mother, go mother goddess uh, Ninhurseg from, um, from the, the legend of Gilgamesh, right? The epic of Gilgamesh. And so um, there's a possible connection there <laughs> um, that some people have made, which I think we'll bring up in a second. But uh, her name was changed to Alice for the English for some reason. Um, but in the epic of Gilgamesh, um, this mother goddess... Uh, you know the goddess of fertility, Ninhurseg. She creates uh, in Kidu the the like the beast man who is sent to like defeat and humble Gilgamesh, right? And so there are some people that speculate that when um, uh, when Fey sort of like has his episode um, in the in the gear, right? right that, that there's like a like a, a kind of like a beast side, we'll just call it for now, right? A beast side that emerges from him, that was living inside of him, that this was like sort of onset by Aruru or Alice, you know, being in danger or, or whatnot in, in the village. Um, I don't know if that connection is purposeful or not, but that is the name of the character in Japanese. Interesting. So, Feels like a lot for uh, such a minor character, but... Yeah, uh, I don't know if I buy it, <laughs> personally. But, but also, I wouldn't put it past this game to do something like it, that. So with with everything being referential, it seems like, it's it's like, okay, that name can't be coincidental. Yeah. But at the same time, it does feel like a little bit of a stretch. I mean, Alice is a minor character because of her total length of time in this game, but she's given a portrait, so you know she's important. And yeah. what happens, what their ultimate fate is, is a foundational point of action for Faye's journey. Yeah. as well so it could be yeah so anyways you're gonna leave and then uh, a little kid comes in the door Dan Dan <laughs> yeah Dan he's uh he's something right uh, chaos element so <laughs> so Dan is I mean I, I would say I would think this is universal people find Dan to be creepy right like everybody yeah. thinks this <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think so yeah um and and it's not even just like what he says later which is really messed up but like he just looks creepy like something is off in the character design, and I—is is there not anything? No one has ever that no one has asked like the art, uh, the the character designer. There's no like uh, I don't know, interview that I'm missing here where someone has had to ask him about that design, right? Is, is there no background info on this? Why did you give a child a receding hairline? I don't yes. know. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> there's so many questions that you would want to ask someone in Zeno Gears. I think Dan just must be so far down the list, no one ever actually gets to it. Gets to it? Because, yeah, yeah, it's just weird. Like, he, he from, like, his, his, maybe even his eyes down, he's clearly a child. But from his eyebrows up, he's like a 50-year-old man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so strange looking. He's got this totally receding hairline, um, receding even more, say, than even like adult characters like Saitan or something like that. Yeah. Uh, 
And so he just, he just, he looks, he, he, he looks interesting. He looks a little creepy. Um, and he's, he's kind of a butthole of, of a kid. Uh, and, and he's trying to like spoil the wedding, right? He doesn't want Timothy to be his, his, his new brother-in-law. So he, he's trying to initiate Faye into this plan to like run off with his sister. Um, <laughs> and, in, and in trying to convince him of this, he's like, just between you and me, she's beautiful, she's a good cook, and she's well endowed too. And he like yeah. chuckles about this to himself like, <laughs> It's yeah. video game. What the? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, Dad, man. I it's, mean, like that—that that is weird and creepy. But Faye gives it considerable thought later with some dialogue that Alice has that I'm sure we'll get to, where it's not entirely an unfounded position on Dan's part, other than the way he phrased it, which is pretty bad. The way yeah. he phrases it, yeah, yeah. He's he's just pulling out all the cards at this point. He's got he's got. Yeah, it's his last play before the big day. Right. Exactly. One, one try left. Exactly. The well-endowed thing was like his final like push to get Faye. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a last just, resort. Like, please, I'll do anything. Yeah. Just don't let Timothy Dan's final smash. His <laughs> final smash. I like that. Um, so yeah. Anyways, you kind of have a choice there in the dialogue. You can say that's crazy, or you can say like, yes, I'll do it. Like, I'll go through with the plan. And I think if you say yes, Dan's like, oh, I know that it's like like not really feasible, but thank you for saying so, kind of a thing. Um, and then if you say, like, no, that's crazy, he'll be like, well, you know, if you change your mind, like, come back and talk to me or something like that. Oh, my Gobrino. I don't know if you guys looked into the Japanese of this, but it's very interesting because it says the exact same thing in Japanese. So, Oh My Gobrino in Japanese was translated... Well, the initial Japanese was in katakana, which katakana is a script used for um, writing foreign loan words and such. So you know that they're just... They're writing a, a foreign script. It's not only used for that, but we'll say that in this instance, it definitely was. Because it says, Oh My Gobrino. That's what it says in Japanese. Oh My Gobrino. Now, I don't know... <laughs> I don't know what it's saying. I don't know what that means. I did look this one line up. Like, what is what is oh my what is goburin? Is it goblin? Is it no? Because they could just do goburin, goburin, goburin would be goblin. Goburin is a different kind of thing. So they um, there's something weird going on here. I don't get it. I don't know if this is a joke. I don't. It seemed like a joke in English, but turns out it, it must it really was just the same line in Japanese. I can't believe that that that's what happened. And I. It just blows my mind. I can't believe that's what happened. And they they meant this is not a weird translation. This isn't some accident. Um, Richard Honeywood didn't, like, mistype on his crazy keyboard console system thing that they gave him. It is written to be that way on purpose, and he translated it about as well as you could possibly translate it. Because that is exactly what it says in Japanese. Don't know what it means. Have no idea. Ask. We have to ask a Japanese person. Maybe I'll try that. Maybe I'll do that this week. I'll ask a Japanese friend that I have and uh, see if he see if he uh, has any idea what "oh my gobrinu" could possibly mean. But then uh, you go talk to Alice, and she's uh, she's getting ready. You know, she's she's basically like uh, made this dress herself uh, for her mm -hmm. for her wedding. And uh, th there's conflicting feelings there. Um, obviously, she has some some feelings for Faye, some secret feelings for him. They, I, they don't really make it very clear whether he reciprocates them or not. I think that's probably yeah. purposeful. Like they want the I player to, you know, kind of use Faye as an avatar for themselves, so they don't want to like make it too clear. But this is where I first started reading Faye as kind of daft. Like yeah. she's kind of giving this subtext or, the, or these hints about, you know, she's being wistful about. If could, they had been born in this village, yes, yes. If they if they had been born here, if things could have been different, what would what would our lives have been like? That kind of kind of really on the nose subtext, I guess you could call it. And Faye just is like dot dot dot. Well, they do that <laughs> romantic tension thing where they start speaking at the exact same time and then stop. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I I think maybe he has those feelings. He's just incapable of articulating them. Yeah, yeah uh, which I can relate to. So I, I, I've used the, the excuse before. I got to go pick up some cameras for a wedding. Sorry, I cannot address my feelings right now. Yeah, so that's exactly. exactly what Faye, that's exactly what Faye is going <laughs> yeah, to yeah, exactly. do here. So that's what she asked him to do, right? Can you go yeah. borrow a camera from uh, Dr. Izuki, Saitan Izuki up on the hill uh, for the wedding tomorrow? 
So he says, yeah, I can go do that. Dan was supposed to be doing this. Of course, he's shrugging his responsibility. Um, but also, uh, I don't think Saitan would have given Dan. <laughs> he would have let him come no. within a <laughs> hundred I mean, yards of his camera. <laughs> <laughs> ultimately, he doesn't even trust Faye to bring it down, as we'll find out That's later. That's true, so, yeah, exactly. Uh, like, after Faye leaves, Alice stares at the wall and thinks for a moment. She wonders if it's fate and then dismisses these feelings, saying it feels foolish, and she wonders who she's kidding. Mm. And then she closes her eyes and the camera goes out to Faye, which I think was a, like a really nice moment of her trying to put those feelings away in anticipation of her wedding. Right, yeah. The nice little subtle touch on the end of the... Yeah, they let it linger there for a minute. So. Yeah. Also worth noting, her aunt in the basement is not thrilled about having to raise Dan to adulthood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, because their parents uh, died when they were young, right? Um, yes, yes. Or at least when, when Dan was probably very, very young. But Because um, I don't know what the age difference is between like Dan and, and Alice. Uh, I would guess like I'm not sure. she's she and Timothy are probably Faye's age and how old is Faye like 18 17, 17 18 yeah yeah something like okay, that okay and so I'm guessing Dan's maybe 10 or 12 or something like that you see him palling around with Sidon's child a bit later so I assume they're similar in age yeah it's it's impossible to tell <laughs> just by looking at him because yeah <laughs> he looks like he's simultaneously like 10 and 50 years old so yeah. anyways and when it comes to the size of the sprites in this game it's like you know, it, it's like the the original NBA Jam port on the Super right. Nintendo, where there was only two body body types, yeah, large and small. Yep, and that and Dan fits in the small category. That's pretty so much it, right? All the adults yeah. are one size, all the children are one size. Yes. In the you whole are either world. Stockton or Malone. Sorry, that's it. <laughs> that's great. I also just have to say this. Oh my gosh, this game is beautiful. This is the coolest game. It looks so good. I love the sprites, the pixel art sprites. I love the 3D backgrounds. I love the limitations of this game. I love how limited you are. Like, because I feel like they can really do something special with this game. And already they're doing it. They, they are just, it's phenomenal. So one of the examples of this right here. As the camera rotates with Faye and Alice talking, uh, as they're talking about, well, she's getting married, right? And she's got her dress there in, in the upstairs. And Faye walks in and they're talking, just the normal talk. But Alice starts kind of, hey, like um, when Alice is talking about how she wishes she had met Faye earlier, there's a nice touch with the camera there. So the camera kind of moves around and shows um, the wedding dress in between Alice and Faye. And that's important because it, it splits the screen in the perspective of the viewer that there is a barrier between Alice and Faye, that she wants him and he maybe wants her. I, I think he probably does, but I, I don't know. We don't get a ton of time with character development here before things go wrong. Uh, but it seems like at the very least she really wants him, but this wedding dress is in the way. Darn it, this darn wedding's in the way. I don't know if it was prearranged or if it was, uh, you know like a family thing. I don't know what, cause she had known Faye for a while, but apparently she can't marry him. She's got to marry this other guy. Dang it. But she really likes him. So that's rough. But they show that wedding dress in between the two of them to show that physical barrier that separates the two of them. I would say that very much so these, these, the people who made this game, they were like artists, like real, real artists. And it shows within this game. It is so beautiful. It is so well done with the limitations that they had that make it all the more, all the more beautiful. I love it. Um, so Faye, uh, he leaves the village. He goes up the hill. Um, this is one detail that I thought was funny. I don't know if it's like if it really means anything, but there's like an egg you can grab from one of the trees on the way up. It's like a bird egg, and this bird will attack you like all the way up, trying to get you to give it back. And if you don't give it back, and you make your way all the way up to Saitan's house you can give the egg to Yui, Saitan's wife, to cook in the meal that they eat that night. And if you look at Faye's weight, like his weight is listed in like the status menu. Yeah. And it doesn't have any bearing on like the gameplay. It doesn't like change any of your, it doesn't change like your, I don't know, speed stat or your yeah. strength or anything like that. So it has no bearing on any of that, but his weight is listed there. And yeah, then, I think the, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, I think the, the weight mechanic was something that was abandoned Oh, okay. At some point in the game, like they were going to use it as something to do with uh, the sw the speed in which you could swim later yeah. in the game, or something. You can something. also weigh yourself at the when you see a doctor on a certain ship later in the game. Oh, uh, right, yeah, yeah. There's really a scale, weird. yeah. So it's it, it, there's there's weight to that. I think there's weight to the gears that you did uh, yeah. later in the game too, which I don't know if that has any bearing on your on your speed or not. But there's a lot of little hidden mechanics in this game that. That, that you can still find the remnants of, like the like this weight thing. Yeah, so maybe like at one time the plan was that it was going to have some kind of uh, 
you know, effect or something, but then, you know, that ended up being cut for maybe balance reasons or something like that. Um, but what's interesting is I think he's like 167 pounds, like, initially. And you, like, take this egg and you give it to Yui and uh, she can cook it in the meal. You'll get, like, a short sort of, like, dialogue box after the night is over and Faye's leaving where it's like, uh, you know, that, that egg that she put into the meal or whatever. <laughs> um, Faye seems to have gained some weight. You know, he feels a little guilty about it or something like that. And you go into the menu, you look, he's like 20 pounds heavier. It's like 180, <laughs> oh. 187, 189 pounds or something like that. It was a Velociraptor <laughs> egg. <laughs> this game is loaded with bespoke interactions like that, that you really have to fiddle around with stuff yeah. to figure out yeah. all over the place. It's so funny, but anyways, yeah, he, he gains like 20 pounds from eating whatever this meal is that she prepares. I don't think I knew that. Wow. It's, it's really funny. But... Anyways, you, you arrive kind of at Saitan's uh, little house. His house is really cool. I think you guys, talk, you guys talked about this in your podcast. Like the design of it, right? It's just like, it, it, it like invokes this like sort of um, creative inventor sort of like, you know, mind that just like tinkers with a lot of stuff and, and like has, you know, this project going on over here and this unfinished project over here. And, and so it's like, it, it's, it, I don't know, it's just a really cool design. It, it's one of my favorite um, architects. Yeah, it's like, who lives little, here? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Would you want to go outside whenever you want to go to bed? To get to your, your bedroom? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. weird. Yeah, it's like one of my favorite architectural pieces uh, in the whole game. It's just, it's really cool. Um, we so, mentioned the the uh, the spelling of Saiten's name. There is a, a signpost here when you first come in, and it does actually have the letters S-H-I-T-A-N on there. Oh, does on the it? On the texture, yeah. You have to rotate it properly to see it, and kind of, you may have to squint depending on what you're, on what you're playing on, but uh, it's there. But when you actually go up and, and interact with the sign, it just says, all, all sick or welcome, no deceased, please, or something of that nature. Wow. Something very cheeky. I don't yeah. know if he's being funny or if that's actually happened so many times he has to have a sign yeah. saying more dead people. <laughs> Please stop bringing dead people to my house. Thank you. So it's spelled in English. Shaitan, yeah. S-H-I-T-A-N. Yeah, like yeah. not the text that you click on and read, but on the actual texture in yeah. the game. Yeah, yeah. And I, we, we, we first noticed that when we were we did a, a, a bonus episode on the on the game's demo, and I thought maybe it was something that they took out of the demo, but then I went back and looked at the actual game, and it's, it's there. Wow, that's crazy. So uh, that may be how the original developers expected that to be localized in English, but of course they they missed the obvious, the first four letters. So. <laughs> There's a lot of weird texture work in there. Later when you're in Kislev, there are like digitized JPEGs of pinup girls on the wall that had to exist somewhere else at some point. So right. it's, it's a wonder where they got all their um, images. Exactly. <laughs> That's really interesting. I did not notice that. I'm going to have to go back in and take a look at that now. Um, but anyways, you go talk to Yui. She says, uh, this is another interesting localization issue. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you're talking, he, he's asking where Saitan's at. And, and Yui says, I think he's tinkering with his junk in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. I, you cannot convince me that that line was not written by one of the localization uh, editors who quit the team. It's before like, I, Honeywood yeah, got there? Like yeah. This, this was their Easter. They're like, I'm putting this in the game. I'll, if, if it gets changed, it gets changed. But otherwise, this is my legacy. And, oh, you know, man. to be quite honest, I wish I had a legacy like that because this is a great line. It's I love when you awesome. see local, localization like that come through. We just got finished with Chrono Cross, which Richard Honeywood also worked on. Right. And at some point during a beauty pageant, you actually see a message from Richard Honeywood about his distaste for beauty pageants. Oh, yeah. really? So yeah, so there's there's plenty of times where I think like localization is 99% accurate, but you've got to put your own weird mark on it. Yeah, I places. think I think he mentions having done that a couple times in Xenogears too. I can't remember the off the top of my head what because I just remember reading this interview like last week or something. But there's a couple of Easter eggs like that even in Xenogears, I think. If I could ask Richard Honeywood one question, it would be about the term uh, that is used in this game later, uh, Mister Puniverse. <laughs> Mister uh, because... Puniverse. <laughs> because that term is also used in Chrono Cross as well by like a a, a Biba or one of those weird goblins or whatever. Yeah. And I, I wonder if that's his little like hidden signature or whatever that sometimes the localizers will will, will sneak in there. It's big in yeah. Australia. Yeah. Yeah. I like Faye's response to her too. He's like, man, doesn't doesn't he ever get tired of playing with that stuff or yeah. something yeah. like yeah. that? He into it. <laughs> yeah. I'd for, I, I didn't I didn't recall Faye. I, of course I knew the Yui line, but the Faye line I was like, oh okay, so we're. It makes it even yeah, funnier. <laughs> We don't know when to stop our joke. <laughs> Much like the retrograde amnesia, we, we don't know when to cut a joke off. <laughs> just keep rolling, man. Just keep it going. Yeah. Keep it yeah. going Inside Titan's house, 
there's also uh, wall art with Japanese characters on them, and I can't read Japanese, but I've always been curious as to what that yeah. is intended to say. Uh, I'll have to ask Case to take a look at that or something. And or, yeah. or I have a couple of other people um, who help me with translation stuff on the channel. I could pitch it their way too. Okay, so I'm making a quick addendum here in response to what he was saying about the uh, the kanji that are on the wall in Saitan's house um, and wanting to know what they mean. So um, ran it by uh, Zen men's in my community who uh, speaks Japanese and lived in Japan, worked in Japan. The one on the right for sure means truth. That one over there, truth. Now on the left, there's actually three kanji. And the one on the top and bottom, we feel like, or he feels like he can identify pretty easily. Um, let me pull it up here. Uh, it's, it's these two, which means like a gale or like a rushing wind, right? Um, however, the two in the middle, these two symbols are a little harder to figure out. Um, we were, he, he was kind of guessing at it and he thought it might be something like this. Uh, these two here, oops, which has something to do with the woman's mouth, <laughs> which I'm not sure if that's right. Um, the, the, they're definitely hard to see, like it's, it's real pixelated and it's, it's tough to tell exactly what those are. But we can, at least for sure, figure out that without those two, it's something to do with a gale. So, that is what the Japanese means on those two uh, wall hangings there. Another thing that uh, Zen Men's is mentioning here is that um, the kanji might be nods to Chinese rather than Japanese, because um, he typed in the 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 kanji, the symbols, and it actually brought up some, like, quote from Confucius or something like that. So, um, they might actually be referencing Chinese characters rather than the Japanese characters or um, some saying of Confucius or something. Of course, I can't read any of this. Um, so if there's somebody out there who knows what this is all about, who uh, reads Chinese, speaks Chinese, uh, hit us up. Let us know if those symbols uh, are Chinese in origin instead of Japanese. Well, I mean, kanji is in general, but whether or not that these symbols mean something in Chinese that's different maybe than the Japanese. Anyway, that's that. There's this. This is probably true by and large in this game, but especially here in Saiten's house, like it's full of junk. There's like stuff sitting on the counter. There's like a you know you know how like it makes me think of like of like. Like Half Life Two, how you would go rummage through a house and you could just pick knock up a bottle over. and look at it and knock yeah. stuff over. But like, there's just kind of things scattered around, and that really makes a space feel lived in. Yeah. And those, th those kind of things, at least before, I, I would think those kind of things didn't kind of rear their heads until you know the era of Half Life Two or Resident Evil or something like that. But in this case, like because of the, you know, like the, it, I, I, I don't know how you feel about the 3D background, the 2D sprites and the 3D backgrounds, but because you have a 3D background, you can just kind of you know, just put stuff on tables and whatnot right. uh, to make those spaces feel, feel you used. You have more agency. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and it, that's especially true here. Yeah. Um, I actually have a note on the, the 2D characters, 3D environments here when we get into the forest in a second. So okay, yeah. I'll, I'll well, get to yeah, that that's that's where it rears its head, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I agree. I, and, and it's part of the reason why I just like Saitan's house so much. Like, it, it really is so well constructed even in just the small details it, it you just get the sense like you said that an inventor type person lives in yeah. this house right somebody pointed out to me once that that this house Saiten's house looks kind of like some of the weird houses in breath of the wild mm. and the i mean it's probably just a coincidence but like monolith helped work on breath of the wild uh, that's so true. Like, <laughs> you wonder if there's like some sort of legacy there like one person that like has a has a thing for junk yeah, houses like helped yeah. help design the houses in there but uh, i'm sure it's a coincidence but i i do i do think it's interesting a, a, a possibility for sure i think it's also worth noting that midori uh, his daughter does not speak yes. yeah I, I i saw i don't know i don't remember where i saw this it was a, a comment somewhere saying like Oh, maybe Midori is the actual protagonist of the game. It's just the silent protagonist, oh. right? Yes. <laughs> like the real protagonist. Like Midori doesn't That's speak. That's funny. That must yeah. be the real protagonist of Xenogears. But there's, yeah, there's. You probably can't. We probably can't get into this no. now. But like, there is, there is some, 
some kind of childhood's end kind of yes. references to the the, the ch- yes. Midori and, and other children who don't who don't speak in this game. So. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. We will pocket that one, shelf it yeah, for definitely. a later discussion. <laughs> Um, okay, so then you actually go out in the back, and that's where Saitan is. is he's working on like a big, uh, like I think he calls it what, a land crab or something? It's like called a land crab. I've always described it as like a steampunk helicopter. Yeah, it's like a helicopter, right? Yeah, um, the, it's just on top of his garage. It's not. <laughs> he doesn't have anywhere else to put it, so he put it on top of his garage. And sure. he's he's sure. he's working on it now. I I don't know how you guys, or if you even remember, like how you felt about Saitan as a character leading up to reveals we get much later in the game. Um, but I kind of feel dumb, like going back and looking at the dialogue right now, because it's, I feel like it's pretty obvious that like, yeah. this dude knows a lot of what's going on and is very involved in some stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. But for some reason, I didn't, I don't know why, if I just, I, maybe I wasn't paying attention or maybe I was, I don't know. I don't know what was going on. But if we look at his dialogue here, right, there's like so many hints dropped in his dialogue about like who he is and what he's doing and who Faye is. Um, so he says, oh, this is no good. Why do they use such inferior parts? This is why their intervention strategy, and then he's like cut off in the middle of saying strategy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and now if we go back to the, the info dump in like the little title crawl, right? They talks about how ethos is uh, helping to excavate and repair technology that's like dug up in Ave and Kislev and then they, you know, they, they give it to them as weapons for their war. So Saitan is repairing technology <laughs> and talking about them, you know, their intervention strat, I think he's about to say strategy. And then, yep. and then Faye shows up, right? So he's his first line of dialogue. He's the first thing he says. He basically implicates himself as being involved in some way with whatever that world is from the, the second that you meet him. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, oh, hello, Faye. Sorry to have kept you waiting. Uh, uh, actually, this is when you go inside. So he, he goes, Faye goes inside and he interacts with like a little music box. It opens up. And this is, an, again, just another layer at which like Xenogears is almost always like purposeful in everything <laughs> that you see. Yeah. Even this music box, right? Like the statue, the actual statue on the music box and the how should I describe it? The slab-like <laughs> wall of the music box behind it. Yeah. Um, I'll just say for now, pay attention to that symbol. It's important. It's, it means something. And the music that it's playing means something too. And this the music is what... Is also diag- say again? It's diegetic. The music is diegetic. It's playing for the characters in the game and the player. Yeah, right. It's 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 like that, uh, you know, the, the music box sort of... I don't know what you... It's just... I think it's just called the music box, the instrument, right? Um, yeah. that playing that little tune. And, and uh, Faye is sort of like captured by it. He's sort of like almost mystified by this melody. It reminds him of something. He feels something when listening to it. Um, and Saitan says, you know, music is a mysterious thing. Sometimes it makes people remember things that they do not expect. Okay, we have retrograde amnesia going on here. So Faye's remembering something. Yeah. Right, many Which thoughts. That, seemed, that, that, that line seems like it was like it fits. Like he's not giving away. He's not giving anything away. Sighton's not giving anything away about his uh, his level of knowledge of the situation with this line. But he can't he can't keep his mouth shut. He keeps going. Yeah, yeah he's 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 dropping a lot of hints here, mysteries. He says many thoughts, feelings, memories, things almost forgotten, regardless of whether the listener desires to remember them or not. And so you know, Faye asks him what it is. Like Doc, what is this? And Saitan again says it was excavated from some old ruins and is still under repair. So again, Saitan is in contact with people who are doing these excavations and is able to repair them. Meaning yep. he has some tie to these third party sort of like institutions that are like involving themselves in the war between Kislev and Ave. Um, so he's got something to do with that, but for some reason he's parked here in this little uh, you know, like backwater village for some reason, watching over Faye, presumably. Uh, long ago, assume, go ahead. Uh, do we assume that this is the first time he's opened the box and he's doing it specifically in front of Faye to see what reaction that's it elicits? A, that's a good question. What do you think? I, I think everything Sidon does is purposeful. I mean, you're, <laughs> yeah, purposeful and then explicitly tied to Faye. Yeah. And I, 
I don't know, like, I think the player is meant to trust Sidon completely through his actions and his battle prowess because he's a really good character. Yeah. So it kind of lets your guard down. And when I was 15, 16, I didn't see any of this. I think you said something similar. Like, it it was a revelation playing it again. And Sidon will always tell you who he is, but you have to, you have yeah. to look for it. Yeah, it's like on a second playthrough or something, it's so obvious. But for whatever reason, I just didn't pick up on it. And I feel dumb for not having picked up on it the first time because it feels so obvious. It's pretty thick. But, I mean, he's laying it on. Like, he's he's definitely involved with this stuff. Um, and, and maybe that's because, like, the, 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 the introduction of the game is so dense that you can kind of just get overwhelmed. And maybe, maybe I, I, I find myself doing this sometimes where I kind of just start to glaze over. It's like, oh, gosh, like, what is this and that and this and that? Uh, I'm a little bit lost here. And so, like, yeah, sometimes of, you can glaze over dialogue and not really, like, read it very closely. A lot of times when you're playing JRPGs, you're ready to get to the meat of the game when you've got a full party and you can yeah. start, you know, tinkering with your characters and, and, and move forward. So you're just, you know, you, you could be... I think at this point in the game, you, people can have a propensity to just kind of mash through the dialogue and kind of keep an eye on what's going on, but really they just want to get to the part to where they get to play the game right. and start to feel more invested in it. As far as you know right now, Sighton's basically Doc Brown. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's kind of yeah, how it feels, good. right? It's a, it's a yeah. Marty and Doc Brown feel to it a little bit. Especially since, for some reason, Japanese developers, uh, basically, by the time you're 28 years old, you're an old man in these games. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, isn't Sighton like 30, it's like 29 it's or like something? It's like 29, like but he might as well be 80. Yeah, <laughs> so. he's basically 60. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, oh, man. So he goes on to say, long ago, people would listen to this melody just like we're doing now. At times they would have been cheered up, while at times they would have been made to, to cry. And then Faye says, Doc, I feel strange when I listen to this music. I feel something warm inside. Um, and then Saitan says, that just may be because you have someone living inside you. And he too must have liked this music a long time before he became a part of you. Yeah, this is what I was talking about where he couldn't keep his mouth shut. Like he's, <laughs> he's giving us, he's <laughs> lo- loading us up with, more, with too much foreshadowing here. I this think. is like, heavy his mom- foreshadowing. And like almost a little bit on the nose in, in a way that yeah. surprised me on this playthrough. I see him as being worried that the stimulus isn't reacting strongly enough with Faye, so he's trying to just uh, add a little bit more gas to that fire just to try to provoke it to come out even more. Maybe. That, that <laughs> he, could be. He doesn't trust Faye, n- nor does he trust us, the, the player, yeah, to, to understand what's going on. Yeah, that's, that's true. I, now that you put it that way, actually, I, I could see that. Like... It's not just heavy foreshadowing or maybe clumsy writing, but he's trying to, like, initiate something. But at the same time, I wonder why he's then so concerned when Faye gets in the gear and he's, like, trying to stop him. Like, you mustn't fight here. No, don't do this. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think he's trying to balance the scales because there's... Like, slowly get there instead of, like, right now? (laughs) Yes. All at once? Okay. He knows he's Goku. He doesn't want him to go Super Saiyan yet. (laughs) He's not ready. He's not ready for this. No. Um... So at Satan's place, the angel emerges from the box, and it looks very interesting. Um, I will say, so there's a white winged angel, right? And it's atop the box, and it's turning. Uh, There is some symbolism on the box as well. There's a tree at the bottom, atop which this angel sits. So the angel sits atop a tree, right? And trees symbolize nature, feminine life, whatever. Okay. And then um, you have... A sun on top, or a bright light, I think it's the sun, but then you also have a sun on the left and a moon on the right, so there's a sun and moon kind of thing going on there. Um, but then there's the bright light behind the angel. But that, that top part behind the angel is weird. It's taller than it should be. It, 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 kind of, it kind of throws off the whole balance of the image because of how tall that back part is going up to the light shining down. It doesn't make a ton of sense that, that, that it would be that, that tall given that the box just kind of opened. Um, but that is what it is because there's some great imagery here, some great symbology, symbolism. That open box with the angel in it is an upside... It's in the shape of an upside-down cross. An upside-down cross symbolizes death. It's symbol. It is. It's funny because uh, Satan looks at this after the angel kind of disintegrates and falls to pieces. Uh, Satan's like, oh, is this an omen? Oh, geez, what's going to happen? Oh, this is bad. I got a bad feeling about this. And it's funny because I felt that way seeing an upside down cross. <laughs> like, but the angel didn't even need to disintegrate it. That didn't need to necessarily happen. You already had that bad omen, that, that 
uneasy imagery kind of going in there. It makes you it makes you feel kind of weird, right? So um, it's unsettling. That's the word. It's unsettling image image uh, imagery of an upside down cross. Um, so then the statue breaks, and I'm curious to what that means. It could mean that an angel has fallen from grace, right? Because the crumbling, the deconstruction of an angel. Um, fallen angel kind of thing. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I don't know exactly what to read from it, but we at least get the ill men and that's hammered home by the fact that Satan says ill men, although he's referring to the angel, you know, crumbling, but either way, um, it signifies a bad omen, right? Okay. And then when Faye leaves, uh, to go have dinner or get prepared, you know, for, for, for eating with the family, um, Satan kind of lingers behind. He says, is, is Timothy and Alice's wedding really tomorrow? It might actually be better to live an ordinary life in this condition as a son of man. So son of man is sort of like a Hebrew idiom, just meaning like a, a human being, right? Like a, a, like just a, a regular person. <laughs> yeah, um, he, he's just wondering if he should go ahead and buy that house in the suburbs and just settle down or should he continue on with this? Well, yeah, this and path? I actually read this maybe as he's thinking about Faye though. Like, would it be better to have Faye just continue to live here as a oh, son of okay. man rather yeah. than like he himself because i mean obviously he's super embroiled and all that i don't think he could really get away with it given what we we who have played the game for know about who sent him here yeah. right uh, i don't think he could necessarily escape from those people but um i wonder if i wonder if he's speaking about Faye there maybe it would be better to let Faye just live a normal life here and he's like yeah, conflicted, that makes more sense. conflicted about the fact that he's pushing him into this role that is going to be really traumatic and horrible. Yeah. Right? And Saiten has a conflict that he's working through throughout the entire game. We don't know what that conflict is and perhaps this is him evaluating his stance on the on on the the conflict that he's yeah. working his way through. Yeah. So, uh, whether regardless of whether or not um, he was going to make a decision on that one or the other, um, he's it's kind of he's kind of thrown into it. Faye, yeah, I mean, I mean, he's kind of thrown into it because when he leaves the house and they're on their way back, um, a bunch of gears land right in the village and they start fighting. And so uh, Faye and Saitan rush back. Um, they're trying to help, you know, people uh, evacuate. Um, and it is in, in the midst of this evacuation, they find Alice and Timothy and they get them out and they, they, they don't know where Dan is and people are running around and buildings are on fire. And Faye kind of comes face to face with one of the abandoned gears, which is the well tall, um, which you becomes like the primary someone, gear. Someone falls out of it shortly before he approaches it. Ah, like right, the pilot yes. ejects dead from it. Yes. Which is a detail I only noticed this time when I played it. Yeah, you, you kind of see someone falling out, right? And so he's, he's kind of looking at this gear, and then you get these flashes of a little pendant, a cross, that sort of swings. And I, I really love these shots. <laughs> um, the sound the, effect is tremendous, too. Oh, like, the sound effect is amazing. It's, it's not just a twinkle. It's like a, an aggressive twinkle. Like it, it's, it's making sure that you, that you hear, not only do you hear the sound, but you remember the sound because it's important. It's like sinister almost. Like yeah. if, a, if a sound effect could be sinister, right? A, a twinging sinister swing of this thing. It's almost violent. It's sharp. And it just like penetrates his brain, right? Like swing. Um, and and it, uh, it's really, it's really good how unique the sound effect is because like anytime you hear it, you know what that sound is, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so like swing, it swings and he's like, oh man, like what's going on? And he, and he looks into the cockpit of the, the gear and he sees a, like basically a child version of himself wearing the same clothes, same hair, but the hair is covering the eyes. And he just has this really menacing sort of smirk. Kind of like a little smile on his face. As and soon then as he, he realizes Faye is watching. Yeah, and he sort of like retreats back into the darkness as like the cockpit closes on it. And Faye is sort of like drawn into the gear. He, 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 he is also tranced. He gets into the gear and he starts piloting it. And he starts fighting back. And when Saitan sees this, he's like, oh, no, Faye, no, 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 you cannot do that. And I think the line that he says is, if he, in quotes, awakens yeah. here, right, referencing, yeah. I, I think if we're putting the, putting the dots together, 
the person inside of Faye who he was referencing just a few minutes yeah. ago, right? They have someone yeah, inside absolutely. of you, right? If he awakens here, you know, like, oh, this could be a disaster, which yeah. is exactly what happens. I, I, were you were going to say something there? I, I was just going to say, I, I really appreciate this moment because I, I'm a big Gundam fan. I love, I love a lot of mecha anime, especially yeah. Gundam. And Gundam puts, especially later on, once it becomes self-aware of, of, of what it's doing, it, it, it focuses on the the get in the robot moment like when does the special boy stumble into the robot yeah. to uh to get this plot rolling and often in gundam it's like it's circumstantial like somebody falls in the robot they happen to be special and they happen to be uh a- able to be the best pilot of this they, they're they're probably a, a a new type which is the the next level of evolution of humanity in the uh in the original gundam storyline and by the time you get yeah. to like the third series like one guy no like one of the captains notices oh uh, that boy fell on the robot, and he happened to to pilot it, pilot it pretty well. Maybe s- s- we should make him a pilot, and it becomes very self aware. And, and but Xenogears is different, and it's even different than like Evangelion, where um, where the uh, where Shinji's father says, "Get in the robot, Shinji." You know that, that became a meme a couple of years ago. Yeah. But in this case, it's different because the robot is literally beckoning the main character to get inside because that yeah. is the the course of action that needs to occur in order for uh, this plot to execute, and I, I think it just it differs from what I was used to seeing in in kind of the mecha fiction. Yeah, but as we see later on, there is a a cross shaped item that is kind of tick tocking across the screen in a hypnotic fashion as he is kind of recalling images of I don't know. Because Satan says the weirdest line. He says, "Like there is, there is some another being inside of you that's calling out, that um, is longing for something." And um, I don't know because I'm I'm looking at this and I see, I see like maybe some childhood memories in him as he approaches the, the gears. I see him recalling his childhood, and. Um, seeing his child self, right? And it seems like, because he, he doesn't have memories of himself past three years. He's brought to Satan, I think Satan, who's he brought to? Not Satan. The, the old guy. I can't remember his name. He was brought to the old guy by somebody who said, hey, take care of him. And he's like, okay, I guess so. And so he doesn't remember himself before three years ago. So before three years ago, when he sees this cross, uh, he is able to kind of he's able to get an image like a glimpse of of his younger self. I, I think. I mean, that's as far as I can tell. That's what's happening. From from a world building standpoint, it's also fun to note when Faye hops in the gear, the text is all garbled, but then it kind of sorts it out to English and it says "Lamb Ignis dialect." Yeah, piloting experience, easy mode set. It's like translating for yeah. Yeah, for the language that he speaks, and and you, you see more of this later when Ellie shows up, right? Like she starts speaking this other language. And even Saitan speaks that language to her. So it's like taking this other language and like on the fly, I guess, like translating it for him so he can understand what he's doing. Yeah, from a boy from a village that doesn't appear to have plumbing. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so he could pilot it, right? Yeah. Um, I really like the, the UI too, uh, just kind of that's on the screen when you're inside the gear mm. battling. It's, it's, it's just really cool. It, it, it's got a... Especially in contrast to like the the on ground battle combat, which I also really like. I really like like the the button combinations you do, the little martial arts like motif to it. But then like in the gears, it's like really techy, and it's it's like almost what you would see in the cockpit, you know, like displayed in hologram form all around you, kind of a thing. Yeah, and there's information in that kind of HUD. It's not necessarily. Uh, necessary information but there, there there's some information that like when your character gets the equivalent of blind it'll say camera off or um there's some percentage values later in the game once you unlock the ability to do the uh, additional combos and stuff so there's, there's a little bit of information there and they never point it out you just kind of have to notice it but it, it is a nice little speck of of world building i think yeah it's great um so he's fighting um, and Dan is eventually found. He kind of runs up to Saitan. He was there trying to save um, his sister's wedding dress from the fire. Um, Saitan kind of takes him and evacuates, but uh, he, he leaves another really interesting sort of <laughs> foreshadowing piece of dialogue yeah. there um, where, where Dan's like, well, what about Faye? What is he doing? He's inside of that monster. What's going on? And, and he says uh, he's bound by the cruel, dark destiny of God. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and that the I really love the cinematography there too because it's sort of panning left where like Saitan's looking from behind and it kind of shows like uh, Welltall's face there. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, Welltall is, is a very kind of, a, it's, it, it's color scheme, it's kind of a dark, um, kind of like uh, serious, severe looking face, right? And it's like Fey is inside of this thing. He's part like bound by the cruel, dark destiny of God. Really great line. Which um, is a line that only Saiten would say. No one else would say nobody that. Nobody else except would say that. Except for that one drunk guy in the bar. And that's nobody it. Nobody else. Uh, I guess that's true. Yeah, the guy, yeah. The guy in the bar. <laughs> um, anyway, so he keeps fighting, but then um, there's a sort of a trigger that happens, right? Like Timothy comes running back into the village to try to get Dan. And, and he's like, oh, there you are, like, come on. And then uh, there's a gear who appears and, and, and points a machine gun at Timothy. And, you know, despite Faye's attempts to be like, no, they have nothing to do with it, stop. Timothy gets uh, blown away. Um, very bloody. By the way, T-rated games in this era used to have a lot of blood. I forgot yeah. how much. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, this was, you know, a big problem. And, and people who watch my channel know, you know, my, my gripes with the Final Fantasy VII remake. But um, one in particular was the fact that they kind of removed my favorite scene from the Midgar arc, which was the trail of blood that Cloud follows uh, up the up the sh the floors of the Shinra building um, when Genova escapes. Right? Um, it's just like such an, an crazy, impactful moment. And and one of the reasons that was speculated as to why they did that, they kind of replaced it with like this purple goop stuff in the Final Fantasy VII remake, was because of the the fact that it would that be rating. rated M if, if they showed yeah. too much blood. But it's like, dude, when we were kids, T-rated games had so much blood, they had blood everywhere all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can mask it a little bit differently just because we're, the th things were less realistic looking. Nathan That's Drake true. kills a thousand people, but none of them bleed. I know. <laughs> yeah. um, like literally a yeah. thousand people. There's like a, there's like a freaking, uh, isn't there a trophy you can get in the game for killing a thousand people? Yeah, for killing yeah. a player too. <laughs> a self-aware trophy, I think. Uh, shortly before Timothy is shot, I also think it's important to notice the camera briefly focuses on a mysterious gear that is different from the other gears that have landed, just posing by itself, observing yeah. everything. Yeah. It zooms in on his face, and of course, if you are if you don't remember seeing this gear, then it's the one with the arms crossed, so uh, something yes. that we'll come to find out later. And it's I think I forgot that that gear was present in this particular scene, yeah. but it is here, and it, it seems to be commanding some of the other gears, almost as if it, its purpose is to taunt Faye into what's about to happen. They do a pretty good job of differentiating between the different gears in, in several different ways. I mean, there's like the yep. design and the color scheme, obviously, between like Welltel and like the, the grunt gears that he's fighting, right? Um, but also with that gear you're referencing, he's always got that like, almost like T looking pose with his arms crossed and his, like, his legs are together, like pointing yeah. down. So he's got this very straight, and then like broad shouldered T kind of pose. And so like, yeah, this, this gear is commanding the others it appears. And gives the command to one of the other gears to shoot Timothy. It, it mm -hmm. like, like takes notice, nod. it like takes notice of Timothy. And it takes notice of the fact that uh, Faye is freaking out about trying to save that person. It like, no, whoever is piloting that gear notices that and then gives the command to kill Timothy. Yeah, it's all very deliberate. Yeah, very deliberate, which is interesting. Um, so once Timothy is shot, again, we have the pendulum swinging and Faye is in a lot of, it appears, physical pain and distress. And then he it shows a shot of him, you know, it shows the pendulum swinging, but then it shows him looking down and he has, in adult form, the same kind of like hair over his eyes, sort of like hairdo, I guess, of that yeah, little mm -hmm. kid that he saw earlier. And all of a yeah. sudden he gets the same smirk on his face and then just berserks and destroys the whole town, the whole village, and all the people who have not evacuated. It shows like a very quick shot of Alice as she kind of looks at her hands and then is just like, just disintegrates. Right. Yeah. Amazing job on the destruction of Lehan. That is so good. That is quality. Like, that is really, really well done. For the pixel arty graphics of a 32 bit system, the PlayStation, that was so well done. The, the random flashes and the sounds and the red and the, the warpily. I mean, you may think that it's like, ah, what are they going for? This looks weird. I look at that and I just see incredible art, right? This is really good. This is really, really good. Really, really, really well done. Um, because with the limitations of the time, I didn't see that very often. I didn't see that of these games around this time. This is a very well done, like war chaotic kind of sequence that's happening here. And it's, it's incredible. So Satan then later on, 
He says that Faye is bound by the dark, cruel fate of God. This is after Faye gets in a gear that was seemingly beckoning him, using a cross as a sort of tool of hypnosis. It seems that there was another time in his life, or the time of someone he knew, where his memories are extending towards, but as of now, I can't make anything up. It's important that at that point, once that Faye transitions to adult Faye, he no longer fears the chaos, but embraces it. Yeah. And just, it, it's his ultimate expression as a result of what happens. Yeah. And so um, he awakens from this and with all the villagers just super afraid, suspicious of him. Um, oh, one thing I was going to mention too is that, you know, as weird as Dan's design is, uh, his like character portrait, it actually isn't quite as bad in the little anime cutscene it shows when like Faye goes berserk and destroys the city. Or the yeah, town. I think everybody in general is kind of stretched out a little bit. Everybody's like a lot leaner in the in their anime counterparts. Yeah, he he looks a little bit more like a normal kid. <laughs> yeah, in the yeah. anime version, he doesn't have like the terrible receding hairline. But, anyways, um, Dan is furious. Obviously, doesn't know what to do with his grief. Blames Faye uh, for everything. The villagers do the same, and uh, Saitan. The, the villagers are more afraid of him. Like, Dan's angry. The villagers, when Faye approaches them, they actually yeah, back up. Yeah, they're like jumping fear. back, right? Yeah. So, anyways, Saitan says, you know, it's probably best if you leave. Um, you know, we know that this was, you're not entirely to blame for this, or I know that you're not entirely to blame for this, right? Like, but, like, it's probably not best if you stay here. Yeah. And they have this great shot where the camera pulls out and it shows Faye just, like, standing there looking up into the face of the well tall. It's like he didn't realize it was there until yeah. people started talking about it because it was like directly behind him. But then they do the, 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 the thing with the camera that you can do with the 3D background is just kind of swoop it around and show what, what the entire scene. It's really great. Yeah, it's awesome. There's also a slight line about some xenophobia there. There's some chatter among the villagers about how they should have never allowed a foreigner to live in their village, mm. which is a theme. I, it's not overt, but it is something that had to be in the back of their minds at some point when Faye came to live there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of chatter during the when you're actually in Lahan Village about how the community is very close-knit and all the women are expected to uh, be married and settle down there. So um, you can you can imagine that, that letting somebody in, in live there that is not from there could be a, a, an issue, especially when it comes to this, this type of conclusion. Yeah. So Faye decides to leave. He uh, is uh, basically, Saitan uh, tells him, go through Black, uh, Black Moon Forest and like uh, get into Ave and you know, uh, I'll, I'll kind of catch up with you later kind of a deal. Um, and so as he's going through this forest, you know, he's really struggling, <laughs> as anybody would, with feeling yeah, res too. responsible for the destruction of your village and all the people. Um, yes. And the player themselves is struggling with the camera here because you yes, can't tell what's going on. <laughs> this, is where, this is where my note about <laughs> the camera comes in. So I love it. I love the aesthetic of a 2D sprite character in a 3D world, I like it in Grandia as well. I, I really like just that that aesthetic for the PlayStation 1 and, and when it comes to JRPGs, I think is possibly my preferred like look for a game of that era. I um, agree. I, I really, really like pre-rendered backgrounds too. They have like a different feel to them with like the little 3D characters, but um, and, and you know, I, I love the way that they do like parallax and other tricks to like make the backgrounds come alive. Yeah. But I prefer this. The only problem I have with it is that they need to they need to provide an option to pull the camera back a little further. Um, like when like when you're on the world maps in the PlayStation Final Fantasy games, they have like this high isometric view where like your character is very very small, or you can pull the camera way down, almost like eye level with them, so that you can see to the horizon line. Right. Right which allows you to, in either form, because you're pulled way back, or you can see the horizon line, you can see far ahead. But in Xenogears, the camera is too close at the isometric view to give you like much of a, of a good sense of orientation of what's around you or what's coming up. And you can rotate the camera, which is cool, but like you can't pull it down to eye level to see the horizon line. <laughs> so yeah. it can become very easy to get lost because what it really needs is a mini map, and it doesn't have a mini map. No. It just has a compass, a useless compass for the most part. A totally useless compass because it, it's like, what's the point of differentiating north and south if I can't like 
see any landmarks and I can't like, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's too close to the character to really be able to navigate efficiently without a minimap. One thing I forgot to mention here is that there are sections in the game later on where you can traverse in the gears where they do, you can choose to be in the gears or out of the gears. And they do have like a really small version of the character's pixel art. And so like in these sections, it's a little easier to navigate um, for, for the reason that I'm describing because your character is much smaller on the screen. Now, I wouldn't, you know, want to like the character always to be this small because you can't like even see any like detail in uh, in face sprite here. A little bigger than this, obviously, but smaller than what is typical on the on the other maps. Uh, so that you just, you have more room to kind of see what's around you, right? But anyways, I forgot to bring this up. There are these sections later on in the game where the, the characters are smaller on the screen. And this is, this is where it's a little bit easier to see what's going on around you. And so, and on top of that, from the high angle, there's a lot of things that can come into the foreground and block the view. So when you're running around in the trees, these, these tree trunks are constantly like getting in the way and like obscuring uh, the camera. And so I like it a lot. I, lo I love the look, but I just wish you could either pull out a little further when you need to, or that they had included a mini map and it would really help with navigation in the dungeons and stuff. Yeah, I think that's one of those compromises of the original PlayStation where if they lowered the camera, you'd have to draw more of the upper area, which is fine for world maps, but not for like enclosed spaces. Because right. like, later when you go to Bledovic, you can see the frame rate get into single digits as it tries to incorporate all the NPCs and all the stalls when they right. actually try to get ground level like that. Yeah. So I agree it's a problem, but I think it's a one of the compromises Xenogears had to make to exist. I think that you're probably right. And they talked about similar uh, problems on Vagrant Story too. Uh, that's why there's not very many people or things <laughs> in Vagrant yeah, Stories yeah. like environments, right? And they're polygons um, too. In that game. There's a hard polygon like limit yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was definitely like a way of like keeping the game functional, running. <laughs> um, but anyways, you're, you're going through this forest and, and you encounter new character. And what's interesting, it, orange hair uh, girl, she's kind of got like more advanced sort of sci-fi uniform that she's yeah. wearing, right? Um, she's holding a gun. And um, she's talking to him in this language and then she realizes, oh, he, he doesn't understand what I'm saying. So she starts speaking in, you know, whatever, I guess, common tongue or land dweller tongue language. Yes, <laughs> Lambian. <laughs> uh, and, you know, they, they have a little bit of back and forth. She's, she's very confused by him because he seems to not really care whether he lives or dies. And she, like, fires a warning shot and he's like, why aren't you, I'm right here, like, why don't you shoot me? Yeah. And she's like, are you making fun of me? Like, you know, and she, she, she starts using this terminology for, uh, for, Land dwellers, lambs, right? Referring to them as lambs. Um, dialogue here again, I think I feel like is a little clumsy, a little on the nose, like for the benefit of the player. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And there, there's a couple of strange terms that are used because, like, as as Faye's mental state becomes more apparent to the to the woman that's pointing the gun at him, she, you know, he's trying to do. He's, he's almost like in like a suicidal state where he's like he doesn't care if she yeah. she hits him. She tries, to, of course, to shoot but shoot him, but can't bring herself to do so. And um, she, her response to that is, like you said, ask if, if he's mocking her, but then she calls him weird, which seems like a mm. strange word to use in that situation, to call somebody weird when they're in the middle of sort of this like breakdown. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it gets a little clunky there. Yeah. Um, but essentially <clears throat> the takeaway is uh, she's from some other place that where there's, I guess you could call it like a, class structure or whatever. She she feels like wherever she's from, they're above. Li well, quite literally, we'll find above. <laughs> um, yeah, they call it surface dweller, and so, but, but we don't know as as players if she's from space or if she's from, you know, some large tower or, or whatever. Yeah, she says place. she has orders to kill all surface dwellers. Yes. At a certain point. She, like, it was like part of her mission uh, protocol, I guess. Like, she comes across a surface dweller, she's supposed to just kill them. So this is what yeah. whatever society she comes from thinks about lambs. Right. Yeah. So anyways, um, but she ends up getting uh, struck from behind 
by what is it? It's some kind of elf, <laughs> like it's a, a forest it's a elf. Forest elf, but this entire scene was from that elf's point of view, which is slowly revealed to the player, like he's uh, observing, watching all of this happen. I didn't notice that. That's yeah, actually true. Now that I think about that, that's crazy. And so yeah, he attacks, uh, and then Faye helps her, and then uh, they kind of have a campfire where they talk a little bit more. Well, as yeah, a- as Faye goes to help her, he says, "Get your hands uh, off yes. Ellie," which yes. means either he. Like she exists as a suppressed memory, or Faye has read the instruction manual of this game and knows yeah, her name. She one or the other. she has not said her name. She has not right. told him who she is yet, and yeah. and he jumps after the elf and is like, "Don't hurt Ellie." He yep. says her name before she's ever said it, and and, yeah, which, and she kind of brings this up in the campfire. So he's like, "Uh, I think he says like somehow I already knew that." Yeah, that's exactly right. what he says. Yeah. Yeah, she, 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 she was really hesitant at first to give her name to him, and then eventually she's like, oh, I'm Ellie. And he's like, oh, Ellie, somehow I already knew that. So again, Faze, no hint drop there. Yeah, Faye's Faze, Faze disposition during the, the campfire scene is strange because like one of the first things he says to her is like, aren't you, are you still going to shoot me? Are you going to shoot me? And he, so he's still got this like weird... I don't know if he's got a death wish or if he's mocking her or what. Suicide but, by cop. Yeah, yeah. Close, yeah, it's close to that. And... Uh, but at the same time, he's like, aren't you going to thank me also? So he's, he's looking for a thank yeah. you, and he also he's looking for that. So I, I don't know if that's some, something to do with the, the translation or the writing itself. It's just a little odd to me. I, I agree. There is almost kind of like um, a, a, a confused motivation for the character there. Yeah. Where like in half of it, he does have like a death wish, and he's like super depressed, and he doesn't care. But then the other half, he's like trying to be helpful. And yeah. Uh, almost trying to make friends with her or something, or, or like, hey, let's cooperate and get out. It's it, it is a, yeah. a bit strange. <laughs> she kind of counters that too with with saying that you know she's not. It's not personal that she's that she wants to that she was going to kill him. It's it's uh it's uh, because she's being cautious. Yeah, uh, is because she's just met a quote suspicious service dwelling lamb, and I think Faye Faye has a a pretty good moment here where he correctly points out I think that Ellie is we're, I'm, we're assuming her name is Ellie since he called her that Ellie is more suspicious than he is because you know she's a stormtrooper with a pistol and he's just a yes. guy in a forest and which yes. I agree with you there Faye like you actually had a moment of lucidity there yeah it's a, it's, re- it's a really good point like you're way more suspicious than me <laughs> yeah his reactions are also national natural ways to process trauma where he still has this his death wish but he's also helping her saying hey we have to camp here monsters hate loud noises he's still trying to be helpful to her like his natural state is shining through uh, in between his trauma, his traumatic moments. Yeah, that's yeah. true too. Very good point. So anyways, they kind of continue on together and then, you know, Faye's really struggling with the trauma of the of Lahan village being destroyed, him being a part of that. He's tar- he's kind of starting to deflect blame from himself. Like, it wasn't me. You know, if, if they hadn't like landed here and started fighting, you know, it's all them, them, them. And um, she knows, and as it is revealed that she is one of them. <laughs> she was forced to kind of crash land there in near the village. She kind of shot down, right? Um, and so she almost engages in this blame deflecting as well, right? Yeah. Where it's, he's, he's saying them, them, them. It's like, why don't you take responsibility? She yells at him like, you know, you're the one who decided to get into that gear. And I think the, the really important takeaway from, from this, the, the revelation, I guess, in the text is it takes a lot of training to pilot one of these gears. Not just anyone could do it. Yeah. And it's like, okay, now we've got all these hints now. Like his ability to paint, his ability to do martial arts, Saitan talking about like some person inside of him, this music that reminds him of like something in his past. And now Ellie, you know, inferring like, you have to have had training to be able to pilot yeah. a gear like this. Like, this doesn't make sense, right? And th- yeah. and we get a little bit more uh, a few more layers here too during the the dream sequence in between the the, the campfire and the next day when you go adventure out with Ellie oh, where good there's point. that I almost skipped that, over that that anime dream sequence where it's it's like a boy version of Faye in the middle of a desert and out in the like the horizon or the distance there's just like these there's actually 12 or 13 I think it's 12 12 yeah 12 like shadowy figures that are lurching across the 
the the edge of the of the desert, whereas this like young Fay or whoever it is 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 screaming to wait, wait, help. And there's there's twelve of them. They're just walking away. Keep in mind, if you're playing this game for the first time, there's twelve of them. Twelve. And yes. and um and then as as the 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 dream or whatever it is comes to a close, uh, the young Fay meets a adult looking Ellie that has. Does she have the pendant? She, she has the pendant. Yeah, yeah. you she actually hear the sound effect. I noticed it this yeah. time. Yeah. There's a little sheen on the pendant, like a, a little like a reflective light, like shing, and you hear that sound effect. And it's like, oh yeah. my gosh, like it's right there, the same pendant. Yeah, and I think this is like the best, at least early in the game, this is like the best piece of, of kind of foreshadowing because unlike the intro and unlike some of the, the, the other little hints we've been given, we do have some context for what's going on here. We have somebody who looks like Faye and somebody who looks like Ellie, and we have the pendant, and it's all there in this in this dream sequence. Which, I mean, you you may forget this if you're playing this the, the, the first time through, but like, it's it's at least giving you some questions to ask. You're not going to get those answers for 60 hours, but there's a lot of questions you can now ask about what's the significance of 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 this vision here. You forgot about the cherry on top was she reaches out her hand cuz he's asking for help and oh. it mirrors the Sistine Chapel shot of oh, the man. hand of Adam and God. Yeah, where, oh, which where actually their fingers can, yeah. are reaching, right? And yeah. they're, they're touching Like fingers. right before they touch it cuts off. Yeah, which yeah, that kind of that that almost mirrors the kind of the um one hand helping another. Yeah, that yeah, that the one-winged angel stuff that we'll see later and the the kind of the um the the wholeness of the aeons as the, as the, the Sophia and, and everything have to come together, but uh, I think we're way too early to, to start getting into to that start stuff. digging into that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, uh, thank you for reminding me that that scene is is really important. Um, it might seem like really again kind of random or abstract or whatever, but these these are slowly pieces being put into place for a story that has a time scale that it's. Is is astounding. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I, go ahead. And this this is the first time I've played this 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 sequence since we did the podcast like a year, almost two years ago, I guess now. And I, I'm still shocked about how much they cram into the first you know hour and a half of the game. There's it's, so many mysteries. There's a lot. So many mysteries. So many things. So okay. Um, and anyways, Faye kind of breaks down. He starts to um, accept responsibility or whatever. He's like super depressed. And she makes a step toward him as if she's going to try to comfort him or something. But then she just decides to leave. Yeah, um, right. And in doing so, we get into her head a little bit. And we find that she's had a similar type of thing happen to her. Where she inadvertently killed a bunch of people. <laughs> we see all yeah. the blood. Um and, you know, she's kind of went through a similar traumatic sort of um, accidental massacre that in her past. And, and so she's like, oh, why did I say all that stuff to him, you know? It, it was yeah. a way for her to deflect responsibility from what she had done in, well, in Lahan, but also in this memory of hers, right? Yeah. And some of the interiority that Ellie is giving during, the, during this anime sequence where you can kind of see her. I don't know if, who she's talking to, but she's talking, she's saying... Uh, trying to say that she's not that talented or, or not that special yeah. uh, to whoever the receiver of the dialogue is, and implication being that that Ellie also has some sort of special ability. Like we're we're learning that Faye has special ability to pilot this gear with with no training, and now what is her special ability? Yeah, why is she important? Or, or some of these other questions that are being introduced to us right here. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, five minutes after the other six <laughs> questions were introduced. Yeah, she uh, she has something. Also, some kind of mystery, something going on with her that is similar or mirrors a little bit of what Faye is going through, too. Along the course of that conversation, you also get a brief flashback that lets you know that Ellie's team was the one that had the gear that Faye is currently in. Yeah. Like, yeah. if you look, she's in the cockpit. Faye's gear is hovering in the background. They have to make an emergency landing. Ah, right. And right. then at some point, Faye also says he feels like he could hear someone whispering to him, telling him to get into that gear. Yeah. Yeah, which is probably a reference to the... The evil, fa evil yeah. smirking fae boy that, that was in the cockpit. Yes, exactly. So, after that, she's uh, made into a damsel for the second time in, like, five minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as, uh, she's the uh, one with the gun and the stormtrooper armor, and, like, later we're going to find out she's got a cool... Or, actually, we already know that she's got a cool, like, beat stick that she can yeah. take out enemies, but yet... Like a baton? Yeah, like, it's weird. It... it, it, it I know that they had to do something to get us a gear tutorial in the, in this game, but it, it's strange that it had to happen in this manner. Yeah, she has because she's clearly like highly trained and yeah. capable, 
and can fight. Certainly but, has the training to be able to run away from a dinosaur, I would think. <laughs> yeah, and it is. It's just basically a T-Rex, right? Yeah. Um, so you end up uh, running back, or Faye ends up running back to try and help her. He tries to just fight the thing with his bare fists. That's not working. And then Saitan shows up with the repaired land crab helicopter carrying the Welltall gear with him and drops it. And of course, Faye's like, oh, I don't want to get into that gear again. <laughs> but he wants to help, you know, Faye or Ellie or whatever. So he jumps it's in. It's a great shot. It's cool. Yeah, because it, it shows the land crab kind of hovering over the, the into the forest. And as, as, the, uh, as it lowers, the camera swoops in front of Saitan to reveal that that's who it is. It's a really cool moment of like, you know, the good guy showing up at the last moment to save the day. It's, it's one of, kind of one of the first times this game really gets the, the blood pumping from like an action action perspective or like a shonen uh, anime perspective because right. it does it a lot and this is the first time it kind of does it. So the, the junk that Saiten had been tinkering with was the land crab <laughs> for this exact purpose, right? Yes, like yes. That he maybe knew this was going to happen or could read the tea leaves and knew he would need it fixed soon. Perhaps. Yeah, maybe so, yeah. So, yeah, so he shows up, he gives you the, the gear, you get inside of it. At this point, um, if you're, and I, I describe in, in kind of in detail how you unlock um, death blows in this game in my review of the game. It's very obtuse. The game never yeah. explains it to you. Um, but essentially, like each, I, I'm not going to go over it. Just go watch my review if you want to learn how it works. <laughs> yeah. But it's possible to have unlocked Faye's first uh, death blow at this point, which is Ry Rygene, I think. I think um, so. It, which is uh, Triangle X. And, but the gears have like corresponding, um, corresponding death blows. They're yeah. not the exact same combination of buttons though. So like the first death blow in the, in the, that corresponds with Rygene, I, I forget what it's called, it's some other word. But you press Triangle twice if you've gotten one point. Um, you have to like accumulate a battle point or something like that first. But anyways, right. you can do some pretty sweet damage to this dinosaur and kill it uh, if you've unlocked that death blow. It's not like it's very hard to kill it anyways, though. I think all the battles up to this point have been pretty much like almost. Yeah, this is mostly, yeah, mostly a tutorial here. Yeah. So uh, anyways, you beat it. They have one more kind of camp out scene. Faye's asleep or at least pretending to be. And uh, Saitan is kind of speaking with Ellie. And again, it's made pretty obvious he knows who she, not who specifically she is, but where she comes from, like who yeah. she's with and uh, what they're doing. And he's kind of like trying to, you know, encourage her to leave in the night. Like, please um, don't interfere. I don't want you around him. <laughs> yeah. He also speaks the, for, for a moment when he's trying to identify her, she, he speaks the, yeah. the fake language to her in order to, to get that going. And I also thought it was kind of interesting, like, right before they go to sleep, like, as they're kind of debriefing after the, the Rancar dragon battle, uh, and Ellie's still passed out, like, Saiten and Faye still d decide to have, like, a an ideological sparring match when they're talking about, like, the nature of power. Yes. Uh, just before they, they, they go to bed, uh, because, you know, of course, Saiten identifies the robot finally as, as, as well tall, and we, we now know that, that what, what it's called at this point in the game, and... Faye, he agrees with Saiten's assertion that they need to protect themselves with this newfound power. He says, Faye says, quote, but it's, <clears throat> excuse me, but its power goes beyond what is necessary. Does one really need the power to destroy everything? Saiten doesn't respond. Well, he, he, he does respond, like, he doesn't respond directly. Yeah. But, like, Xenogears never misses an opportunity to, like, facilitate any sort of ideological sparring or anything of that nature. So, he just kind of directs, uh, addresses him directly by saying, Faye, using power or being used by power, is that not the problem of the heart? If humans do not use their power for wrong, it can be a good thing. I believe such power can help us. So it, it kind of, Saiten is taking the position that like, we humans need to use, try to acquire, not, not only do we, do we try to acquire power, but we also try to use that power for good. Whereas Faye is like, that power in and of itself is unnatural and bad. And yeah. therein lies the, kind of the conflict between what Saiten is going through internally throughout the game and kind of the nature of, of power and the structures of power that will, the many, many structures of power that we, we will uh, encounter throughout the game. Mm. Saiten also tells Faye the fight was remarkable and no other gear could have defeated that, this level one boss. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, it's like right? <laughs> I would hit like a single and my dad would go, whoa, you're probably the best hitter on the baseball team. Oh my God. Good job. 
That was really yeah. that's that was a really funny line, and I I, I felt totally unnecessary too because it just felt so yeah. like clearly yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, obviously other gears and stuff that you fight later in the game are more powerful than this thing, and there's no yeah. reason why they wouldn't have been able to kill this freaking T Rex <laughs> in a yeah. forest. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, good stuff. So Ellie uh, ends up leaving in the middle of the night, but Faye, of course, was awake and did hear some of the conversation. Um, and so yep. this is where, I think the next day as they're getting ready to leave, they see like a giant like uh, ship fly overhead. And um, you know, this is where Saitan sort of like reiterates some of the, like the political background that yeah. we got earlier. He identifies that ship as a Gebler ship. Right. Uh, and then he, he specifically mentions, he, he says that Gebler is the special forces from the sacred empire of Solaris, which is our first mention of Solaris in, the, right. in, in this game. And then Faye wonders if, if Ellie was from the Gebler force and Saiten suspects so. Yeah. It's also important to note that Ellie cited scripture saying shepherds able to control over the surface dwelling lambs and possessing the right to give life and death unto them as they see fit is her justification for wanting to slay surface dwellers. Mm. And then if you're talking about overt symbolism, she tells Saiten she was taught at Jugend, wow. which if you look up the terminology for that is the Hitler Youth Program. Oh, wow. So they're laying the fascist stuff on pretty thick here. Yeah, mm. I forgot about that. And that, that that's interesting too that you bring that up because there was, uh, during that conversation during the campfire the night before, uh, Saiten was what he, he was kind of wondering aloud why Ellie was different because apparently he knows the nature of these right. of, of these people of these non-surface dwellers and he's like well a normal a normal one of you would have you know just killed us because because we are you know basically I think they refer to him as domesticated animals or I think is how they is how they uh, refer to the lambs and Saiten is pointing out that Ellie does not necessarily have the same kind of um, I don't know she's not operating under the same kind of moral code as the as her counterparts are she says besides I am the same as Faye which is also some foreshadowing yeah it's foreshadowing and it's ambiguous it's uh, that, that's one of the things that's hard to hard to parse at this point in time yeah well um, I think that actually carries us up to where we had said we were going to stop for this week as you exit Black Moon and you yeah. are heading into Ave. And that first, the that first town in the distance, that's Dazzle, right? Yes. Yeah. Dazzle or Dazil. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I think we said Dazzle. It's it any sounds, way you want it to be. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> pronounce it however yeah. you want. People, you probably already know this, but if people correct you on the pronunciation, we, we, we live our truth. You, know? <laughs> you, you pronounce it how you want to until we get to the I, I course, totally I gave up on that. Like My initial run of the Final Fantasy VIII podcast, right, which was on our archive channel, I tried to, to dig into a little bit of, maybe this is how this name's pronounced. And then when revisiting or, or re-uploading it to the main channel, I just cut all that stuff. I just, I just give up. Like, yeah. <laughs> Pronounce that however you want. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, doesn't matter. In our Final Fantasy VIII podcast, we had the Kistis Quistis conversation, but ultimately we just went with the one that we liked better. Yeah. We, we were just like, that's the one we're going to say. So sorry. Yeah. 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 Which is why I like Saitan. And yeah. I would prefer Titus in Final Fantasy X to Titus, which is apparently what it is, but whatever. I'm Team Titus. Yeah. yeah. I think it was, yeah. I, I heard a commercial or something that said Titus at one point in time. Yep. I was like, I've been Titus ever and, since. And the but, voice actor, um, oh, I forget his name right now. Uh, Ratchet James Arnold? Yeah. Arnold, uh, Arnold Taylor, yeah. Um, he says it's Titus too, and it's just like, ugh, come oh. on, mm -hmm. please. That name is so weird. Anyways, anyways, uh, good stuff, guys. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining me today. Do, do you have anything else uh, that that you picked up on or that you'd like to say before we wrap up here? I did have one more thing. When Faye is leaving Lahan Village, the camera frames, like he looks at Veltal and turns his back on it, but the camera pulls down and showcases uh, Veltal staring back at him, kind of watching his back, never getting him out of his uh -huh. sight, which I think is another instance of, um, like the game doesn't have a lot of big directorial moments with its polygons, but that felt very intentional. Yeah, yeah, I could definitely see that. Um, this stuff, I, I, I did not expect, I just looked at the time. I think we've been going for pretty close to three hours again. <laughs> I was expecting that once we moved to a weekly schedule, these would get down to like an hour, an hour and a half a piece. And that's just never the case. But I appreciate right. you guys uh, staying on for the whole time and talking with me. It was a very fascinating conversation. Thanks for letting us pinch it. Yeah, we appreciate that. And uh, I, this is probably not any solace to you, but like as our, as we went deeper and deeper in our podcast, our episodes got longer and longer as well. Yeah. So uh, good luck it's, it's with just, all of this. There's just, it, the game is just so dense. And, th and that's part of what's so great about it. And why it has so much replayability, right? Is every time you, you dig back into it, you can catch something that you didn't catch before. And that, that's part of why I loved these Squaresoft JRPGs from the 90s, especially the late 90s PlayStation era, 
there's just and you guys just did Chrono Cross. It's it's very similar. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, everybody should go and check out Retrograde Amnesia. Um, I forgot that you guys had done Terra Enigma as well, but that's a, is that an exclusive thing that's, to your Patreon? Yes, that's yes. A, we uh, for Patreon we have covered Terra Enigma and Parasite Eve as our mini series. We've also done uh, what eleven epi- extra Xenogears episodes. Radical uh, Dreamers. We covered Radical Dreamers, which I love Radical Dreamers, yeah. uh, and we covered uh, the Xenogears Perfect Works, where we did a a goofy little uh, quiz show format where Eric wrote how many questions? 500 multiple choice questions. Yeah, he wrote 500 <laughs> multiple choice questions for me and I answered it and we had a good time with that. That's uh, amazing. And so I we've got all that. kinds of weird st- weird stuff on the on the Patreon. Retrogradeamnesia.com. So. Oh yeah, we've got the, how did you we get the retro, domain name, yeah. how did we get retrogradeamnesia.com? How did a scientist not own that? I don't know, but we have it now. So. That is phenomenal. It, Go check out j- retrogradeamnesia.com. Yes. <laughs> Go check out yes. their YouTube channel. Or look them up on Spotify or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Uh, check out their Patreon as well for some additional uh, analysis of some really, really excellent games. Uh, Terra Enigma is one of my favorites, so yeah, uh, it's a uh, wonderful game. Actually, your Terra Enigma video was kind of what made me. I was aware of it, but it made me more aware of, of what it was. And I watched like five minutes of it. and I was like, we need to cover this game. Yeah, it's uh, so that's it's pretty. That's, deep. When, that's where I came up with the idea to do a mini series for you know for the for the for the Patreon, and then. Uh, so I watched a little bit of it. We did our series, and I went back, back and watched your your full video. And that's 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 one of my favorite ones that you've done. So Terra Enigma, Terra Enigma yeah. is a wonderful game. Everyone should play, and I'm sure we'll cover it at some point too. But anyways, thanks again, fellas. Really appreciate you. Everyone, go check out Retrograde Amnesia, and we'll see thanks, you Mike. again next week. Peace out.